Going with our next session here, uh, we've got Eric Eager, uh, Associate Professor of Mathematical Biology at UW Cross, as well as a data scientist at Pro Football Focus. Uh, Eric received his PhD in Mathematical Biology in 2012 and was a professor at UW La Crosse ever since. He's the author of over 20 papers in applied mathematics and a scholarship of teaching and learning. He joined Pro Football Focus in 2015 and has been one of their analytics leads since January 2017. Please join me in welcoming Eric Eager. Thank you, Scott, and, and thank you for putting on this this conference. It's uh, it's a lot of work, and you know, and and we all get to enjoy the fruits of it. But it's it's because of people like you that these things are possible. So uh, thank you. Um, Scott said I'm um, at Pro Football Focus currently, uh, and uh, I'm one of a, a few people that do sort of analytics and data science with our extensive data set. But I would be um, probably I would be missing out if I didn't tell you that this is joint work with Steve Palazzolo, um, one L two Z's there in both, um, and and he's our like our quarterback person, kind of comes up with all of the like sort of grades and charting ideas. And then George Shahuri uh, is basically uh, the person that I work with on analytics, and he's terrific. So um, both of those guys did a lot of work that contributed to this. Um, and so the motivation here, I think, if you know, for people in here that are American football fans, right? Like the the motivation here, I think, is is clear, right? Football is, you know, I think the country's most popular sport, and quarterbacks are the most important position. No matter how you sort of slice the data, if you look at it, you know, Vegas spread win probability models, et cetera, et cetera. It's always the, you know, it's always the play of the quarterback at the NFL level, especially, uh, that sort of moves the needle the most. Um, and yet, like, what we see oftentimes is even, like, getting to average at the quarterback position is often not enough um, to, you know, to, to have a viable team on a consistent basis. There's a very much a winner-take-all approach. Um, and, and hence, we've seen a lot of investment uh, and, and, and the investment ebbing and flowing in the NFL from you know large contracts for, for established players to you know leveraging many many draft picks to draft the the, the best prospects in the in the NFL draft etc. So we we've seen a lot of different investments, but teams are certainly investing a lot of uh, of what they're doing into uh, the quarterback position. And the that the comes the problem though in that like. We simply have a we have a difficult time evaluating them even uh, you know even now no matter what we know. So for example, uh, if you look at uh, and a season, so this is from 1990 to uh, now, just looking at the average quarterback passer rating. So the the passer rating that that we used when we were younger, and you know I was watching an NFL game from 1988 a, a while back, and uh, the the starting quarterback for the the Cardinals had like an 82 career pass rating with something like sixth all time, okay? And if a guy has an 82 pass rating now, he's a bum, right? So um, we, we, have, you know, we have this sort of compression of evaluation, and yet we have sort of an expansion of importance at the position. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty, you know, sort of difficult problem. So traditional quarterback statistics aren't going to sort of lead us there. And this is my funniest. So uh, I, I follow the Kansas City Chiefs uh, as the pro football focus and also just as a fan. And we did have this statistical anomaly this season where Alex Smith, who was a former number one overall pick, uh, his passer rating actually eclipsed that of Tom Brady. Um, and, and in many ways, he had similar statistics to Tom Brady. And so this was from ESPN, I believe like NFL Live or something like that. We, we were lucky enough to grab this. And said, so, is Alex Smith just as good of a quarterback as Tom Brady? And, and I think that that sort of sums up the difficulty associated with trying to evaluate the you know, efficacy of the position. And so, now this is predating obviously the Alex Smith versus Tom Brady non-problem problem, but uh, the, in, in the mid, middle of the last decade, Pro Football Focus was founded by Neil Hornsby, who was basically just kind of unsatisfied with the way in, in which um, you know, st traditional statistics were measuring the game. So his example was sort of like a linebacker making a tackle 15 yards downfield, is getting the same tackle as a linebacker making the tackle within a yard of the line of scrimmage. Uh, and so he developed, and we've developed over the course of many years, a system to grade players on each play, attempting to measure the good and the bad things each player did on the field, independent of what the teammates did or didn't do. That's a hard problem, but that was sort of what that was set out to do. Um, and we've gained, I think, a decent foothold on the community. We have 
all of the NFL teams as clients. We have four uh, Canadian football teams as, as clients, and then over 30 uh, you know, FBS teams uh, as clients. We also have media deals with Sunday Night Football, CBS, Fox, and NFL Network. This is just a few of the things that have made it on uh, Sunday Night Football over the last, I believe, year. Uh, credit to the aforementioned George Shahuri for, for these graphics. Um, as some of you might know, Chris Collinsworth owns Pro Football Focus as of 2014, and now he's the, he's the color commentator for Sunday Night Football. So that's kind of the connection there. Um, okay, so can, do these grades give us a better idea of what's going on? It is really the question. And do some of the other things that we chart uh, give us a better understanding of what's going on? So just kind of a brief thing. Now this is a big collection of things, and, and this was kind of our first discussion about what, what we want to look at. Um, what, what things within our data do we want to try to understand? So um, what we've looked at is, is basically quarterbacks on all their throws, looking at their PFF grade stability year to year, so this is a correlation coefficient, versus some of the other traditional statistics. For example, quarterback rating, so pro football focus grade on a play-for-play -play basis is more stable than quarterback rating, so we're more able to capture that. The completion percentage actually is a little bit higher than PFF grade, um, but, you know, but we also have things like, you know, we have, um, we look at like sort of differing, uh, you know, differing situations and we have PFF grade coming up on top in, in other situations. So uh, completion percentage is certainly a big deal, but not in every circumstance. What's really interesting here from this chart though, is that if you split up by some of the things that we measure at Pro Football Focus, i.e. whether the quarterback was clean or pressured on the play, you get a drastically different look at how, how much we can glean from the information. So for example, if you look at you know, completion percentage on clean passes, that's almost twice as stable as completion percentage on pressured passes. Um, if you look at PFF grade, it's, it's basically the same. Play action passes versus non-play action passes, we get the same thing. In fact, play action passes, while extremely valuable at the NFL level, um, are almost, are, are not the quarterback's trait. They're something else, uh, you know, as we see with this year-to-year -year stability and stuff. Um, we're talking about positive throws, those are great throws that are graded positively by our system. Negative throws, similarly, big time throws are great, or that get the highest grades in our system. TWP is what's referred to as turnover worthy plays, those get the lowest grade. Um, and so, you know, it, it's pretty interesting here. And there's other sort of scenarios, so for example, when you throw quick versus when you throw slow, we know more about a quarterback by how he does on quick passes than how he does on, on slower, or longer developing passes. Um, and so, and so that's pretty interesting. The further down the road you get, so touchdown passes, interceptions, the key ingredients that make up some of our measures of quarterback performance, not stable at all. And if you, you know, lower them to like pressure to play action stuff, they're almost just noise purely. So um, pretty interesting stuff there. So we decided to take kind of this, you know, exploratory research and come up with a, a, a basically an algorithm cluster quarterbacks based upon uh, their performance. And so we used things like, uh, PFF grade per passing snap, yards per pass attempt, air yards per pass attempt, uh, percentage of positively graded throws, plus 0.5 graded throws, so those are our positively graded but not highly graded throws, and then big time throws, turnover worthy plays. We grouped those as basically nine features, scaled them for seasonal effects, and used them as features in a clustering algorithm. So just to kind of get a look at what this can do, these are just two of those features, but you can get a decent idea of the landscape of quarterback play at the NFL level. So on the on the x-axis, or x-axis here, these are positively graded throws, y-axis is actually the inverse of negatively graded throws. So if you do bad, you do better by going up here. And so we see some of the truly best seasons in the league that are over here, and we see some of the truly worst seasons in the league kind of over here, and uh, as, as any Vikings fan would attest, most of them are like right in the middle here. Uh, as we haven't seen much in the way of really bad or really good performance, whereas if you're a Packer fan, uh, you see your, your quarterbacks represented over here fairly often. So, um, that, that, and that's just two variables, right? If you do, you know, it, so in a, in, in a sense, we're okay at sort of two-dimensional visualization. If you're, you know, pretty sharp, you're good at three-dimensional, but we need, you know, algorithms to come up with you know, how to visualize and how to understand the n-dimensional data. And so, the, one of the ways to look at this is what's called clustering. And there's a few different ways of clustering. We've decided to use k-means because it's, it's the simplest one, but you can also use things like topological methods or hierarchical methods. Those things work as well. Um, but k-means gave us the, the results that you know, we thought were stable, we found to be stable and from the simplest perspective as well. 
Um, and so this is just an unsupervised machine learning technique. Pretty, pretty simple here. We have 12 seasons, so we started from 2006 to 2017, and we have this nine-dimensional data. Um, we cluster these, uh, these quarterbacks, we ordered them by how, how well they graded in our system on a per snap basis. So the best quarterbacks were in cluster one, the second best quarterbacks were in cluster two, and what we'll find out is it's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. And so here's just sort of another way to look at this. So this is using principal component analysis, so looking at the kind of smushing down nine-dimensional data into two-dimensional data. You again get to see that our, our you know, PFF grades plus a little bit of extra data is doing a good job of sort of separating quarterbacks into groups. And those groups not only are, uh, as we'll talk about, quality, but they're also kind of type, too. And, the, and we'll talk about that in a second here. So this is how 2017 shook out. Um, the top cluster, I think somewhat surprisingly, but Tom Brady, Matt Ryan, Russell Wilson. So those are the, the quarterbacks that stood out historically. So there are going to be other quarterbacks from other years. That's why they're not equally spaced out. Um, but last season, you know, Tom Brady is the MVP of the league. Russell Wilson led the league in touchdown passes uh, and probably uh, sort of hidden by some of his supporting cast. Same thing with Matt Ryan. He had a lot of plays uh, that where he performed well, but his team sort of uh, helped, you know, came up short for him. Cluster two, so this is the second tier of quarterbacks, but there's a caveat. The difference in grade per snap between cluster two and cluster three is not, terrific, is not big. It's just that the way that you get there is a little bit different. So these guys are throwing more positively graded passes that are of the like plus 0.5 variety, and fewer of them that are the plus one, the plus two, and the big time throws. But they're also limiting the turnover worthy plays. So these are guys that are performing, in, in, in I think Drew Brees is very characteristic of this cluster, um, just because we, we sort of know him as a guy that throws quick, doesn't put the ball in harm's way, very efficient, uh, so on and so forth. Alex Smith, really interesting, he was a downfield passer more this year, but if you actually looked at all of his, I mean, it was more memorable in that sense, but you actually looked at all of his throws, he was actually a more of a, a conservative player, uh, even then. Um, cluster three is second tier, but risky, okay? And then that's where you kind of get, I think, some of the players that we're more accustomed to seeing here. So, for example, um, Carson Palmer is a player who's very high variance, right? So he can go from being basically second in the MVP race in 2015 to being retired two years later, right? Just because of, of some of those issues. Um, Deshaun Watson also kind of in that in that group. Uh, Jameis Winston very very much a downfield uh, up down player. Carson Wentz um, I think is probably on the boundary between two and three, maybe even one if you um, if you look. Not to offend a reef over here, but um, okay. So and then here's and then here's what every Vikings fan wants to see: the third tier, uh, but safer player. Uh, you have. You have the Blake Bortles, the Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins, this is a reduction in his, he was better the, the previous two years. Um, Joe Flacco, Mitch Trubisky, Eli Manning, Brett Hundley, if you're a Packers fan, probably not a, a great uh, memory for you. Um, cluster five, third tier risky, and that's the Andy Daltons, the Cam Newtons, Deshaun Kaiser, another Packer, um, and then Blaine Cabot, uh in there. And then the sixth cluster, poor 49ers, uh, is the lowest tier. And this is sort of independent of like sort of, <laughs> Uh, uh, of sort of uh, style, they just kind of set themselves apart. Um, okay, and, and here's sort of the visual on them. So these do these things do sort of overlap, but you're looking at kind of the principal components here. So if you think about like this visual, this is two dimensions, but you sort of think about it in nine dimensional space, you can kind of like open it up, and that's where you probably you, you know you see sort of horizontally Hoyer closer to Beathard and Cutler there. Um, but you know, very you, you do see that they do sort of cluster each other. Uh, around there, uh, Blaine Gabbert, poor guy. Okay, um, and then and this is the this is the you know year to year stability in those clusters. So what, what I like is like this is sort of ground truthing the fact that like this way of evaluating quarterback play is sticky, right? It, it's something that sticks with the quarterback. If you're a cluster one quarterback one year, you're basically you know the plurality of the time ish you're a cluster one quarterback the next year. If not, you're in the cluster two. Um, cluster two quarterbacks are either in cluster one or cluster two the next year, so there's some interaction there. Very few sort of fall off. Cluster three quarterbacks are pl pl plurality of them are in cluster three the following year. Same with four, same with five. And if you're in cluster six, you're not playing quarterback the next year probably. So <laughs> that, that's kind of you. Ha you do see some come up to two. I actually believe one of them is Case Keenum, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from six one year to two the next. Um, so that that's kind of like quality of play. And, 
we're, we're still like, all these things are like, you know, something we're constantly being informed by, by um, quarterback coaches and teams and everything. So, you know, we're very much, this is the first attempt at doing this, but we're, we're as I'll talk about later, there are some things that are gonna update here that I, I think will make this even better. Um, but the next thing that I wanna talk about is style of play, okay? Because I, I know, and if, if, I'm, if I'm honest with myself, I look at some of those clusters, I'm like, well, yeah, but this quarterback has training wheels on, and this other quarterback is asked to do literally everything for their offense. And so if I call this guy a cluster one, and I call this guy a cluster one, I'm still obscuring a little bit because of you know supporting casts or you know the difficulty of what a quarterback's asked to do. And so what's really cool at PFF is we have data points that can allow us to sort of try to come up with, with what kind of a quarterback a player is. Um, so here are some of the variables that we're using. These are things that we track. Um, percentage of each route type thrown, so you know, one, two, and you can get as you can get pretty grainy here, you can get pretty um, crude. You can talk about in-breaking routes, out-breaking routes, or you can talk about literally the four route versus the five route, that kind of thing. Um, the average depth of each type of, thro of route thrown, okay, so how, how far downfield are you going on each particular route type. Um, percentage of dropbacks that use play action, right? So we see that characteristically in teams like Los Angeles and Atlanta are using a lot of play action, other teams aren't. Uh, that, you know, as we saw earlier, sort of changes the dynamic a little bit. Percentage of dropbacks from the shotgun, your average time to throw, your average time to pressure, which I think often in, intuitively we think that pressure is, a, is a, an offensive line trait, but it, I think it's a dual trait between the offensive line, the scheme, and the quarterback. Um, and then percentage of dropbacks that resulted in runs. We eventually took this out because we're trying to understand how passers, we know that running from the quarterback position is important, but what this gave us is just a cluster of quarterbacks that run all the time. And, and that's not really what we were looking for. Um, because there's a lot of variability there and it, it does skew things. And so here are the style clusters. Now we ordered them by <coughs> basically um, time to throw. So the longer it takes you to throw, you're in the first cluster. The quickest guys will be in cluster six. Um, so we get some interesting results. So um, just kind of looking there, Jared Goff, uh, Matt Ryan, notice this, these are, as I said, sort of offenses that are characteristic of each other. Um, if you allowed for uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, Garoppolo to uh, go above the threshold, he would have been in the same cluster as Matt Ryan, which is encouraging given that he had the same offensive coordinator in 2018 that Ryan, 17 that Ryan had in 16. And again, you see some of these thematic things. So nobody's going to confuse Brett Hundley for Aaron Rodgers, but in terms of what they're asked to do, they're, they play in the same offense, they end up in the same scheme cluster. Which is, which is encouraging. The same thing for Beathard and Hoyer. Um, now this was, a, this was something that we wanted to explore because they, they ended up in a different style cluster than Matt Ryan, but they're quarterbacks that are far weaker than Matt Ryan and Jimmy Garoppolo. So you know, in some sense, that we're calling this style instead of scheme because you know, oftentimes you have to change the characteristics of the scheme to fit your quarterback. So um, anyway, so that, that's one. Uh, we also had uh, Palmer and Gabbert from Arizona in the same style cluster. Uh, ben Roethlisberger, Deshaun Kaiser, you know, Tom Brady, James Swinson, and then you have the, the quickest throwing quarterbacks this season ago, which are Matthew Stafford and Derek Carr. Um, so again, these are not equally distributed because we're throwing in uh, we're throwing in years worth of data. So there are going to be some years that you know cluster six is more representative. There are going to be years where it's not. And so we. Um, we wanted to look at the Kyle Shanahan style cluster, so we've been back a few years, 2012, 2013, when, when he coached uh, the offensive coordinator for Washington. Robert Griffin III was in cluster two. 2014, he was the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns, cluster two for Hoyer. 2015-16, Matt Ryan was the same. Beathard and Hoyer were in four, but Garoppolo was in two if you allowed for uh, you know, his attempts to go in there. Um, so there is something characteristic about his style uh, of, of coaching, which is cool. Okay, so just looking at a few of these, like sort of ground truth thing, like what type of quarterbacks do things for teams in terms of winning football games. Here are the first team all pro quarterbacks from every year in the pro football focus era. There was only one, which is 2010 Tom Brady, who was not in the upper tier in this algorithm. So the all pro voters know what they're doing, at least, or we know what we're doing relative to them. I think that that's a good ground truth. From the Super Bowl winning quarterbacks, this is a far better slide when we gave this talk on February 2nd. Um, but but post-February 2nd, we had this, this interesting Nick Foles, like, uh, so if you, if you put Carson Wentz in there, then it's cluster three, it looks a little bit different. But none of these, the only, the only team that won a Super Bowl with a truly poor quarterback 
in, in a season was the 2015 uh, Denver Broncos of Peyton Manning. And the plurality of the Super Bowl winning quarterbacks are cluster one guys. Um, makes sense. Joe Flacco, or is he? Even his season, he, he was even good back then. So that was good. <laughs> um, just looking at a couple things. So we've, we've knocked around a few ideas on like trying to, trying to come up with like a wins above Deshaun Kaiser, wins above replacement kind of like metric. And, and so like, unfortunately Kaiser was below such a thing, right? So like the Browns would have been like a three and 13 team had they had put somebody else in there. Um, and, and again, like these are sort of more qualitative for now. We're still trying to make sure that we have everything in place, but just this kind of like thinking about orders of, of magnitude. Tom Brady a season ago, including playoffs, is very, very valuable. And, and no, none of the non-quarterback players can even touch any of these numbers in terms of war to sort of to sort of make that out. You know, you have some wide receivers and some defensive backs and guys like Aaron Donald that can be full wins, but but it, but quarterbacks are really the only ones who are consistently. And what's interesting is even if you are like of the Andy Dalton ilk, right? So starting Andy Dalton over starting a replacement level quarterback is worth is worth uh, full wins because. Replacement level quarterbacks, as many teams have seen, is uh, they're they're quite poor over you know a top twenty guy, um, and so yeah, for example, Trevor Simeon, who's the Vikings backup, so to make another trip. Okay, um, so looking at kind of rookie quarterbacks that have that have been in the league of recent uh, you know recently, we have you know Mitch Trubisky, Deshaun Watson, and Deshaun Kaiser. Watson had the best uh, rookie season of the group. Um, although our grades weren't as, as favorable to him as his statistics, he was still uh, pretty good. If you look at kind of guys like, like Jared Goff, he took a substantial step from his first year to his second. Same with, you know, more or less with Wentz. And Prescott took a little bit of a step back. But again, what is Prescott asked to do? That's, that's a little bit of, of you know, clouding that. And then Winston and Mariota have actually been weirdly consistent, at least at the season level. Winston's a very inconsistent player on the play level, but very consistent on the... Um, on the uh, season level, and then uh, if you're a Vikings fan, you probably want to look away because Bridgewater was actually decent at times, and we'll never forget. Yeah, so good. now he's on the Jets. But anyway, so that so those are like how the, the rookie quarterbacks have stacked up. Been very tough to break into the league recently and be an upper echelon quarterback for sure. Um, so to kind of close this out, we're going to talk about a few projects that we've been working on and, and demoing um, uh, uh, recently, which is NFL throws. So. Uh, basically, what this is, is, is been feedback from whether it be people in the media or people in the league or, or even people within our company of looking, like, looking at quote unquote the right data. And so we have, um, we have you know, player, you know, people that are going in and looking at sort of like how accurate a throw is, you know, whether the ball is on the guy's frame, whether it's behind him, you know, uh, whether it's away from defenders, things like that. But even just looking at like what's the expected points on a throw like this? What's the expected points profile on a throw like this? Should we be throwing out throws that every quarterback in the NFL can make consistently when we're trying to evaluate uh, college players because we need, we need players that can make the throws only a few quarterbacks in the NFL can make and the poor ones can't make, that kind of thing. So we try to come up with what we think are what are called NFL throws or NFL separator throws and basically what we looked at here again is things like route type, time in pocket, field position, down in distance, depth of target relative to down in distance, and as I said previously, the grade distribution and the expected points distribution on each throw. So we consider like NFL throws to be things where the best quarterbacks grade the best on them, the weakest quarterbacks grade the weakest on them, and throw types that have the highest expected points, you know, have the highest variance in expected points essentially, right? So for example, a swing pass to a running back, every single quarterback's gonna grade a zero on that PFF, and all of those throws on you know that, those throws have the least amount of variance in terms of what actually happens. I you know on, whereas like a post route is going to be such that a quarterback, the good quarterback is going to make them, the bad quarterback won't. And then making them is worth a lot. Missing them is not is not worth a lot. And so here are some examples. So a rhythm, an NFL throw would be like a rhythm pass, 10 to 15 yards in the air to an inward breaking route on third down and seven or more. Okay, so that's like in one of the clusters. A non-NFL throw would be a short outbreaking route on rhythm outside of the red zone, for example. So those are, and there are obviously more variables there, but I'm just sort of picking out the ones I think are interesting there. So here are the best and best PFF grade earned on NFL throws. So just subsetting by the by the throws that we think are separators, we get exactly the quarterbacks that we think. So Tom Brady, Matt Ryan, Carson Wentz, Russell Wilson, and. Jimmy Garoppolo allowing for sort of a smaller sample. So these are, 
you know, the quarterbacks that performed really, really well in 2017, and they performed really well in the sort of like leverage plays that we want them to. Um, this is sort of a, a difference. This is expected points generated on non-NFL throws. So how, how good is your offense on throws that every quarterback makes? And that's where we see the sort of disconnect between our Deshaun Watson take and the league. Deshaun, uh, his, his wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins led the NFL in, in yards on wide receiver screens. So like, that's not really Deshaun Watson doing a whole lot other than making a throw that every quarterback makes, right? Case Keenum, right, he's, he's getting a lot of help from his supporting cast. Drew Brees, Ben Roethlisberger are very good, good quarterbacks in their own right, but elevated by having players like Michael Thomas and, and Antonio Brown, they've got Bell on their team. Uh, Alvin Kamara as well. So that I think it adds an interesting layer of context. And so when we look at the guys that were coming out, um, we had Baker Mayfield, the, the, the narrative on him, and he was really one of the driving forces of this, was that a lot of his, a lot of his um, uh, efficacy at the college level was built upon the offense around him, players making plays and, and, and so forth. And that's true. He was third in all of college football in EPA generated on NFL throws. But if you subset on those differentiator throws, he's one. So the answer to is he a product of his system or is he really good is yes, right? Both. Uh, so um, we had we had we like Mason Rudolph as well, um, and there, and some of the other quarterbacks like Josh Rosen rated pretty highly here. Um, a guy like Josh Allen did not. So that's just kind of for context. Um, is that Tyree Jackson from Buffalo? I believe so. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you get like Trace McSorley, I believe, uh, Penn State. The guy was rated first there, so very helped out by his supporting cast. And just to sort of finish this off, the last thing that we're going to look at, and actually one of our people that sort of piloted this is in the room, John, uh, in front here, uh, is advanced accuracy charting. So this is kind of to take uh, and put down an extra layer on here, which is to actually look at, uh, you know, not just saying is a guy accurate as to whether he hit the receiver, but kind of differentiating between is he hitting him in stride? Is he throwing the ball away from the defender? Or is he throwing the ball to the ground and the guy has to go to the ground to make the catch and he can't get yards after the catch? And so this is just an example of Jimmy Garoppolo. He's very highly ranked in, in, in throwing passes that are accurate or accurate plus, and I'm not gonna get into sort of the definitions there. And his, in terms of catchable and accurate, he's, he's down further on the list. So he's not throwing as many passes that receivers can catch but can't do much with. Um, and what we found is that, I think as anybody who's watched football would probably tell you, is the more accurate you are, so the further on the accurate scale you are, the, the better your team's gonna do. And what's really interesting about this is this is on plays that we've all graded in the PFF system the same. So they're all, you know, we're not, it's not just saying like we grade accurate throws better, this is like an extra layer on our system. So I believe these are all zero graded throws. And even among zero graded throws, throwing the ball on a guy's frame versus throwing the ball like catchable but inaccurate is worth another yard, okay? And like again, those kind of add up. If you're even a, a further on the accuracy gradient, you get another three-fifths of a yard uh, per pass attempt. And again, these are on just throws that are expected. So this is this is subsetting the throws we've already said are like mad throws, you know? Um, so that's a, that's a really cool thing in that we've already started to fold this kind of idea into our clustering algorithms, into our NFL throw algorithms, uh, and into some of our predictive stuff. So, so this is pretty exciting, and, and I'm really happy this is moving in that direction. And so I think that that's it. Um, just a few things. So if you're into podcasts, uh, George Shahuri and I have a podcast called the PFF Forecast. It's on iTunes. Um, if you'd like to, we, one of our segments is asking, asking ourselves, but also having the, the, reader, the listeners ask us analytics questions. That's something if you want, uh, we're more than happy to do on the air. Um, we also, a lot of this information is in what's called the Pro Football Focus Quarterback Annual, which is, I, which is free with a PFF subscription. So if you go to profootballfocus.com uh, backslash quarterback, you have like a 300 page guide about you know, basically what our numbers mean and, and what they mean in relation to NFL quarterbacks. And then in fact, some college quarterbacks are also put in there uh, previewing the draft. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric Eager or PFF underscore George if you want to do uh, the, the forecast questions as well. Um, and I think that's it. I want to thank Chris Collinsworth, Neil Hornsby, Rick Drummond, who's my boss, and then Fred Videlli, who uh, was pushing a lot of the media stuff and is terrific. So, any questions? Uh, what would you say is replacement level? Like. I mean, obviously Trevor Simeon's had 
there's, there's like one and a half wins below replacement yeah. level. But how did you initially define it? Well, so so we had it was defined by it was defined in our grading system basically as any player that's that any player that was readily available on the street or on a practice squad that eventually played. We looked at like so basically the grade profile of those players over the history of PFF grades. They're not perfect, right? Because there's obviously going to be cases where a good player holds out or something like that. But uh, that's that's where we've gone. And then essentially it's like that player that player is what a zero graded player is. So then when we do our like war algorithm, we basically run the season with this player in it, run the season with the player out of it, zero graded play, and we look at the difference. And that's and that's kind of that's kind of how we go about that. I ask that any other questions uh, you ask Eric after this uh, outside the room, just so we can keep on schedule. Let's have a round of applause for Eric.